amines and acids. Why are they important in a brew? How you doing guys? Welcome to Brew Talk. Got some questions for you. Robert Wright, how important is water pH? My well water is high, 8 pH. You're right, your well water is high. Neutral is 7, so it is 10 times less acidic than normal water. That's what that means. But to answer your question, it depends. It's important, but only as long as you're within the normal range. And here's some ranges for just for your own edification. For beer, 5.2 to 5.5 is ideal. But white wines are made at 3.2 to 3.6. Red wine is 3.5 to 3.8. And mead is 3.7 to 4.6. You know what that tells me? There's a wide range. I mean, it really depends what you're making. However, yeah, you would need to really um, acidify your water. Um, so you'd want to add some acids to your water to lower that pH. 7 is neutral and typical water. Each point in either direction means 10 times more or 10 times less acidic. So basically, you would have to make your water like 100 times more acidic in order to make beer. And then you'd have to make it 1,000 times more acidic, not than that one, but from original, to make mead. Yeah, don't even try making white wine. No, I'm just kidding. You, you, you can. You just have to add some acid. That's all. Uh, Chris Miller, do you check and adjust pH? If you need to increase or decrease pH, what do you use? We don't check pH as often as some people do, um, and here's why. Because it hasn't really been much of an issue, because most things that we ferment are in that low range for pH, but when mixed with water, become in the normal range for pH for most brews. So it's not, not as big of a deal. There is such a wide range that most brews will work. 3.2 to 5.6 is pretty much the working range for most yeasts, okay? And that's why they say, like, white wine is this and red wine is this. It's because of the yeasts used more so than what you're making so keep that in mind also some of that is because if you go too much higher than like say 5.6 in a beer it can spoil before it even ferments so you want to be careful with that anyway the only time i really worry about ph is when we're dealing with something super acidic like if you were to add straight lemon juice okay and you used more than a couple of cups of it i'd be a little concerned about that i think you might be lowering your ph far too much um, however, just so you're aware, 3.2 is really acidic. Like it's, it's pretty up there. I, I probably should have checked what the pH of lemon juice is, but it's going to be here and you can get an idea that when that's diluted through a whole gallon, you know, it's not as acidic. There is a full chart of sugars and pHs in most brewing fruit in our companion article for the sugar video. Okay. If you need to change your pH, let's say you're way too acidic. You can dilute it. That's one way. Um, that is probably the best way. It also works for um, if you're far too basic, but it's so much easier if you're too basic to just add acid because, like, you're at if your water say at eight and you need to go to seven, well, you could dilute it and it'll get there eventually, but you have to dilute it a lot or just add some acid and it'll it'll drop a lot faster. That's a whole lot easier to do. Um, Starry Chloe, does CO2 gas increase the acidity and lower the pH enough to stop fermentation and kill yeast? This was a neat question. In high concentration, CO2 mixes with water to make carbonic acid. I doubt it would change things all that much, and here's why. The pH of CO2 itself is 4 to 5, okay, which is still actually a fine range for brewing. Water is 7, so when you mix it, the most you're ever going to get is like six and that's very 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 diluted so you're not going to get much higher than that and as far as getting lower it's never going to go lower because you're mixing it with water which is more basic so you're actually reducing the acidity i think i answered that question <laughs> nick franz is there a video explaining tannins and yeast nutrients you're watching it well not the yeast nutrient part that's another show Richard Joyner, do cacao nibs add tannins? Yes, though there are tannins in most fibrous things, and even after the process used to make chocolate, the tannins still exist. And that's the funny thing about tannins, they stay through cooking. And that's why, like, even in making beer, even through the boil, the tannins will still exist. How much you're adding is probably negligible unless you're using a lot of nibs. By a lot, I mean like half a pound and a gallon of must or something crazy like that. Hip B Catherine. Would the tea tannins work if one did it during secondary? 
Absolutely. Adding the T in primary is really just to simplify things. It also adds a little bit of nutrition. I actually said a wee bit of nutrition here. It, it, a wee bit of nutrition, very little is added that way, but it is something. Um, a lot of people think we add tea for flavoring, but it's actually for tannins, which increases mouth feel and how the whole brew tastes to you, really. Um, tea added into a brew, though, unless you're using a highly high significant amount of it really isn't there as a flavor and it's not going to change much that's why we get people all the time could i use green tea well sure but why i mean black tea and green tea are really the same thing you're not changing the flavors now if it's just because i have green tea cool go for it but it's really about getting the tannins out that puckery mouthfeel thing that's what we're really after derica yes what do you have for us today <laughs> i'm going to go into further oh, wait. detail oh. wait it's his favorite part. He cannot be denied. Continue. So I'm going to go into further detail about tannins and acids and what they do for your brew. Those are really good questions on very specific things. This is more generalized. There is going to be a companion article for this video as well. And a test at the end. And no, there's no test. Oh. We don't do that. That's okay. Um, where That'd you can see fun. some charts and more information on tannins and acids and where they come from because it's very... Involved. There's a lot of information. <laughs> there is. But basically, um, and I saw this recently on a person talking about wine, and I thought this explained it nicely as far as the flavor profile goes with a brew that has tannins and acid in it. If you think about the base of the brew as being the rounds, the flavors that round the brew, so that's the fruit notes, the sweet notes, all those are the meat of the brew, where tannins and acids come in as the angles. They're the sharp notes. They're the bittering and the sour and the tart that liven and brighten up the brew. So if you only have the rounds without the angles, your your brew may taste a little flat and, and one note. But wouldn't it be round and not flat? Where if you add in those angles, then you have sharpness. And if you think of it like in a, a musical composition, it's more complex and it has a lot more variety in the melody. Well, that's part of adding complexity. Yep. Yeah. Different kinds of flavors yep. coming together, not just different flavors themselves, different types of flavor components. But tannins and acids do more for your brew than simply make a more complex flavor profile. So they also help with preserving and keeping the color of the brew. So acids in particular are going to keep that color to make it more vibrant and they are also going to protect your brew from bacteria a more acidic environment is not going to allow those bacteria that you don't want in your brew to even get a, a hold on it in jeremy zimmerman's book make me like a viking which we really enjoy it's a fun read if you haven't read it i would recommend it and there'll be a link to it on the description below but he has a uh a chapter called preparing for the battle and he talks about tannins and acids and adding them into mead particularly and he has a little subsection about some visits he made with botanists and how they were interested in mead and they used commercial tannins and acids to enhance their brew and then found through their botanical interests that they could get those same things naturally and they felt that it made the flavor of their final product even better than the commercial tannins and acids. It's one of the fundamentals of the way that we do things. Right. right. So that is really interesting and I have a rather, rather extensive list of tannins and acids, the different types of acids, and where you can naturally find those. So you can create a ingredient profile for your brew that has the tannins and acids that you're looking for to um, include in your brew but also because all these things are natural they are going to act as nutrients which was in one of your questions for your brew as well so you get the full effect of all the things you want to add to your brew naturally without having to resort to chemicals doesn't come in bottles. <laughs> Note about books, by the way. Uh, his book is really good, and we do have it for sale. There's going to be a link below. Um, I just wanted to spill a little bit that uh, I started writing my book, just so you know. You Got did. like a whole two chapters done so far. Probably do a little bit more today, as a matter of <laughs> fact. Just thought I'd throw that in there. So sometime in the next, I don't know, 
months, it'll probably be ready. It's going to take a while. It's going to be a thick, big book. Got a lot to say. Anyway. So the basis <laughs> for tannins and acids is they're important to your brew. They're going to help preserve your brew, and they're going to make you have a better profile overall. As always, guys, thanks for watching, and have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you.